Have you ever eyed a beautiful calafir in the shop, bought it and proudly displayed it in your home, only to find the little diva starts to look a mess after only a few weeks with brown leaf tips, crispy leaves and yellowing? Yeah. I think we've all been there. This was the case with Zebi, my Calafea Zebrina. She looked a right mess, but thankfully, through years of trial and error, I finally learned the things this plant hates and wish you'd stop doing, and I'm going to share it all in this video. And we are sponsored by the lovely folks over at Sansi with some exciting news from them, so stay tuned. The first thing to say is that it's the plant and not you. I know the struggle is real, but even the most seasoned of plant professionals struggle with these plant demons because they're super fussy about certain things and don't mind showing you the first chance they get. But don't worry, it's nothing too taxing, just some things you probably won't expect a plant to be picky about. Now all of this palaver is why you don't see that many calafeas in my home. I don't want to lose any more hair than I already have you see, but I have persevered with Zebi, the fussiest of all Calafeas, and I'm now thankfully at the point where I can get her looking halfway respectable for most of the year. And this is the thing about these plants, even with the best care in the world, it's hard to get them looking great all year. You see Zebi here has some yellowing leaves with brown tips and this is par for the course at this time of year. It's the end of spring, she's just come out of a hard long winter in the Costa del Sheffield and I've not yet had a chance to prune off the evidence of all that suffering. Check in my troubleshooting handbook that you can download for free, you can see that I mainly put this down to dry air swirling around my home from all the radiators battling the cold air. I don't normally bang on about humidity in my videos but calafeas are ones to suffer for this reason during winter. So what can you do about it? After my calafea has had a bit of a rough winter in spring, I like to go in and get my clean pruners out and snip back and prune back this plant. So I'm a little bit late doing it because it is the beginning of summer and I had a chance to go through and do it. But one option you could do, and it's something I used to recommend on the channel, but I think I'm revising my thinking now. You could find a browning leaf or a leaf with brown tips and just cut off around the edge like so, just following the shape of the leaf like so. So cutting off all the nastiness and then you're left with a leaf that isn't so brown anymore. But to be honest, I feel like that is kind of papering over the cracks or stemming the tide because there's clearly something wrong with this leaf. So really, the leaf is just going to go brown again in the next few weeks anyway. So it's much better to just cut off the entire leaf. Now a calafea grows bulbs in the soil from which the leaves sprout through the soil. So what you want to do is go right to the base of the soil and just prune it off in its entirety. And that will reinvigorate the plant once you cut off some of the browning and yellowing leaves and it will encourage it to send out new growth. Here she is, Zebi is looking much healthier now. So I've pruned off quite a few leaves. Any leaf that had any browning or yellowing whatsoever, I trimmed off. I wasn't shy about it whatsoever. And the great thing about this is not only are you tidying up the plant, it looks like you know what you're doing with your plants, it's also kind of opening up the plant. So it's allowing air and light to get into the middle of the plant. And that should make the central leaves a bit healthier as well. This next bit you definitely don't want to get wrong because it will send your little guy into a tailspin of yellowing leaves and crispy brown edges and you'll be questioning your plant parenting abilities. Now when I first got Zebi, I was a plant noob. She was maybe the fifth plant we ever owned at Casa Sheffield so I was very much starting out on my indoor jungle journey. This would make her about 12 years old. Gosh, time flies when you're absolutely miserable looking after a fussy plant. I jest of course, it's all sunshine and roses around here. So like a bug, I used to keep our Zebi in this spot here. This is my east facing dining room in front of my big bay window here. So that meant that she was getting a direct sun on the leaves and calafeas do not like direct sun on the leaves. I can normally get away with keeping plants in this spot because it only gets morning sun and morning sun in Sheffield ain't great to be honest. It's very rarely sunny, it's very cloudy today as it normally is, normally overcast. But if you keep your calafea 
in a spot that gets direct sun, you're gonna get fading leaves, yellowing, and crispy brown tips. I moved Zebby to this spot here, and she still wasn't happy. This is my fireplace mantle in my living room, which is a good two or three meters away from the nearest window, and it faces northwest, so this is a dark spot. And all plants like light, no matter what you read on the tags or see on the internet, all plants like light, even as easy plant, especially a calafaire, they like bright light, because I'm starting to see some loss of vibrancy in the leaves, a loss of the variegation I'm starting to fade. So what's the answer then, my plant friend? How can we make Goldilocks herself happy? Well, the answer comes from today's video sponsor, Sansi, and their range of fantastic grow lights. Sticking a Sansi grow light over Zebby allows me to keep her three meters from the nearest window and still make her happy. In fact, I reckon a Sansi grow light is the best kind of light you can give your calafaire. They're bright enough to give them the high light they crave and yet won't burn the leaves like pesky direct sun would. Look, I've got this light meter that I use to measure the light in my home and the aim is to get over 500 foot candles which is medium light. Anything over 1000 foot candles is high light and very hard to achieve naturally indoors. Well, a Sansi grow light does a pretty remarkable job of giving your plants bright light without the risk of leaf burn. And when the foliage is looking as vibrant as this, you're in a good place. The first grow light I ever bought was a cheap one from Amazon and honestly it doesn't do the job. Since introducing a bunch of Sansi lights all over my house though, my plants are much happier. My favourite is the clip on light with three heads that comes with a very handy timer. This means you can set it and forget it to come on and off every day. Very handy for lazy folk like me. They've also got grow bulbs that you can plug and play into existing light fixtures. I've got their 36 watt bulb plugged into this floor lamp and it's very bright. The colour of the light is natural and doesn't give you a headache and all the bulbs are LED so they're not bleeding your electricity dry. I've even had a bunch of plants just living off Sansi light in my dark attic but that's a story for another day. One that the chefies know all about over on Patreon. Join by the way. Now, the best bit to all of this is the exclusive discount you can get by following my link in the description because Sansi have increased it from 15% so whopping 23%. So just use my code Sheffield23 at checkout. That's a nice juicy discount, so go check it out. I've got a shocking revelation that will stop your calafaire from ever thriving coming up. But first, let's talk about one of the main things you definitely need to nail to stop yours from misbehaving. Watering. Get the watering wrong and your little gal will be a crispy mess. There's no getting away from that, I'm afraid. Let the soil dry out too much and the leaves will dry out and go brown. Let her sit in a swamp for days at a time and there'll be too much water in the cells of the plant which then burst and turn the leaf edges crispy brown. Over and under watering are the enemy to any calafaire. This was all made so much easier for me when I purchased the greatest gadget since sliced bread. A moisture meter, the best invention on God's green earth. This will tell you exactly how moist the soil of your plant is and I absolutely recommend it to any budding plant parents. So you can use your finger of course, you can stick your finger deep into the soil and feel for moisture, but I find my fingers to be a little bit unreliable so I like to rely on technology. So when you're using your moisture meter, you wanna stick it about there. You wanna go into the kind of bottom half of the, the pot because that's where the roots are going to be, the majority of the roots. So if that's wet, you don't want to give it more water. If the top is dry, it doesn't matter so much because that's not where the roots hang out. So you want to stick it deep in, and I like to do it in multiple spots of the plant. So this is reading six, which is pretty much bang in the middle of moist. So there's three kind of areas on the moisture meter, dry, moist, and wet, obviously. And that's bang in the middle on six in that spot. Stick it in there, and that's reading seven. And I like to do one more just to make sure. And that is reading eight. So this plant does not need water. I would water a calafaya when it's getting to three, four going on three. That's when I would water this plant because they do like to have moist soil pretty much at all times. They don't like to dry out fully. Otherwise you get the crispy leaf problem. So this, this plant is not ready for a water, but let's pretend that it's on three and it does need a water. And I'll show you what we do. So the name of the game with this plant and any other plant really is to make sure that you water thoroughly. So you don't want to just take your watering can and just give it a light water over the top like so, just until the soil is damp, because that probably means that you're not giving enough water to this plant. 
You can't overwater your plant at this stage. Overwatering is about frequency rather than volume. It's about keeping the soil always wet. So you can, it's what I like to do, is take a can like this, this is a 1.5 litre can, and just fully drench all the soil as much as you can until all the water's coming out of the bottom as well. So this kind of makes sure that all the soil is fully wet and all the roots are getting their drink. In the early days of my plant caring journey, I'd be a messy so-and-so. I'd take a plant over to my sink and merrily splash water all over the leaves whilst giving it a drink. Now this isn't normally a problem for tougher plants, but for fussy fairies like Calafaeas, you can start to see the leaves weakening and even mold developing. Noticing this was the time I switched to bottom watering my plants. It's not as gruesome as it might sound, trust me. It's just a case of popping your plant out of the decorative pot and adding about a third of the volume of the pot of water, like so, and then sitting the plant back down. So there's no splashing on the leaves, plus there's a nice even watering of the roots from when the soil wicks up the water. I've got a deep dive on bottom watering that you can check out in the top right corner. Now, let's talk secret killers. This absolutely blew my mind when I first discovered it two years ago, and since correcting the problem, Zebby has never looked better. Well, better than the mess she was in anyway. The same goes for her fussy pals like the green orange plant. You've seen me watering Zebby over the sink and through her bottom, but what I've not yet shown you is what I add to my water. And I'm not talking about fertilizer. This is actually my number one tip when it comes to this plant. Most of us use good old tap water on our plants, and it's this that can be causing other untold damage to sensitive plants. Why? Chlorine. Again, I mentioned this in my free plant troubleshooting handbook, but if your water company is using chlorine to treat the water, then your calafaeas will be wanting to run to the hilltops. They're really not a fan. The buildup of chlorine in the soil of Zebi had her in pieces, so much so that I was itching to chuck her in the bin. But a few of my subscribers saw my pain and they recommended water conditioner as a remedy to my woes. So as a last Hail Mary, I gave it a go. And the results blew my mind. The crispiness and yellowing has massively decreased in tons of my plants, not just Zebi, and it's starting to look like I know what I'm doing. Sort of. I've got a video all about this in more detail that is linked in the top right, but the question I always get is how do I use it? So the thing with water conditioner is that a little goes a long way. It says on the instructions that the dosage is add five milliliters per 10 US gallons, 38 liters of aquarium water. So it requires just a very little amount, just one or two drops in a 1.5 liter watering can like this. But to make my life a little bit easier, I nabbed this dropper bottle from Mrs. Sheffield and I filled it with my water conditioner. And it's got a little pipette, so this just allows me to fill my pipette with water conditioner and just add three drops, two or three drops of water conditioner into the watering can. And into my mix, I always add a diluted amount of fertilizer. So I've got house, house plant focused by growth technology. Just add about half a teaspoon, something like that, to the watering can. And I use that to water every single one of my plants every time. So it's a diluted feed. So it's kind of a way of add, adding fertilizer to the plants and not having to remember when you last fed, basically. And then just fill it up with tap water. And this will neutralize the chlorine in the tap water and that'll be ready to water your calafaeas as well as all your other plants. I got chatting to Cybron, the owner of Cybertanica last week about all things soil and he said something to me that both excited me and uh, worried me at the same time. You can buy pre-made mixes specifically for calafaeas from their store and not only is it loaded with the things they need for healthy root growth like perlite and bark but it also comes pre-loaded with fertilizer to help kick their growth on for six months. This is fantastic because it gives your calafaea everything she needs to grow big and strong but it can also trip lots of folks up including me because you don't want to repot your calafaea and then give it fertilizer for at least six months this can lead to fertilizer root burn which is a very difficult hole to get out of i will admit i was doing this but i think i was spared the pain of calafaea death because i use organic feed that is gentler on the roots might have been a different story if i was using miracle grow 
So Zebby isn't the only Calafea success story I can sing about. I've also got Elliot, my gloriously handsome Calafea Elgrass that I love to shout about to all my friends and family. Just look at the size of her. I'm a true proud plant dad. I spilled the beans on how I got him looking so muscular in this video here. So check it out and I'll see you there.